السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I praise Allah the Almighty alone and I send the best peace and blessings upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him Brothers and sisters welcome once again to a new live edition of your program Fatawa um, We do have the same contact information so I would like to remind you in the beginning uh, the phone numbers beginning with the air code 002 02 8 and also the toll free number for callers from North America is 1-800-417-2340 and the Skype address is fatawa.iqra and the email address is fatawa at iqra.com the live streaming is en.iqra.com barakallahu feekum and once again it gives me a great pleasure to accompany you over the next uh, hour living with the Quran and the sound sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we have a few questions which would like to uh, tackle by the time you start sending questions or calling in uh, <clears throat> the first question is pertaining to swimming in Ramadan or while fasting in general is swimming permissible in Ramadan if you are asking about swimming or diving while the person in uh, is fasting um, I would like to refer to the hadith in which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam said asbigh al-wudu'a wa khalli al-bayna al-asabi' wa balagh fi al-istinshaq illa an takuna sa'iman what does it mean Whenever you do wudu, perfect your wudu, wash, or, uh, wash all the body parts thoroughly. Whenever you're making ablution, wash between your fingers and your toes. And do an extensive sniffing of the water in order to clean up your nostrils, your nose, and so on. Except if you're fasting, then a istinshaq or sniffing the water uh, should be very moderate lest you may end up taking some water into your abdomen and you know that fasting is al imsaku an shahwatay al batni wal farj to abstain from eating drinking and the sexual desire so if anything happened to enter into your stomach that would invalidate the fasting unless if it was done by accident or out of forgetfulness so that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the person who's performing wudu, be moderate, do not do an excessive istinshaq or sniffing the water in order to wash your nostrils, lest you may get the water inside your stomach. Okay. So swimming is permissible provided that you do not swallow any water. I know that nobody deliberately desires to swallow water from the pool it's all chlorine and chloride and so on but there is a great possibility it might happen so if the person is certain that he's not gonna uh, get any water into his stomach as a result of swimming then it is permissible add to that not to forget that the person must cover his or her aura even if the person is uh, swimming the second question is why in tashahud we raise up uh, our finger you mean the index finger you mean the index finger uh, there is a sound hadith in which a companion by the name Wa'il ibn Hujr may Allah be pleased with him he said I shall observe how the Prophet وسلم, offers his prayer from beginning to end then he described to us how did the Prophet وسلم, began his Takbir all the way until he finished the prayer. Then when he described how the Prophet ﷺ sat for tashahud, he said, I saw him, he was pointing with the index finger, he was making a ring with the middle and the thumb, and pointing with the index finger towards the qibla, يَدْعُو بِهَا وَيُحَرِّكُهَا أو يُحَرِّكُهَا يَدْعُو بِهَا Some narration says يَدْعُو بِهَا and that's it which means that he was pointing with the index finger and making dua that's it 
there is uh, different opinions with regards to moving the finger up and down or right and left such as in uh, the Maliki Madhab according to Al Imam Malik and Imam Hanifa says you raise your finger when you say La the negation when you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and another Imam says when you say illallah whenever you mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are all ishtihadat these different opinions but pointing with the index finger is a sunnah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi used to do and he said that it is very effective and it is very hard on Satan when you do it in the prayer and you should be looking at it when you're pointing with the index finger towards the Qibla. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother Muhammad from Japan. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. How is your Ramadan? Yeah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Great, alhamdulillah. So, have you, are you done with the tickets and everything, alhamdulillah? Wonderful, alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. Thank you so much. Barakallah wa feek. Jazakallah. So actually I want to ask a question. Last time I could yeah. not. Go ahead. It is about the Hermaphrodite. You know, those uh, yeah, yeah. brothers I'm familiar with or that. sisters. Yes. Yeah, they're not. What does Islam say about that? And I sent a full question in the message box of uh, hmm. Skype, if you can read it. Because yeah. they say there is a hadith a narrated uh, Ibn, from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Yeah that the result of having intercourse during the menses yeah. and i did not find these hadith anywhere i'm like i don't know whether it is authentic or not Five. so far i uh, understood that it is maybe a false hadith in bangladesh so i just want to know why these people exist and what is the ruling of islam uh, about these people Five. Barakallah fi. thank you brother muhammad appreciate it unfortunately we didn't see it, the, the question in uh, in the mailbox but inshallah, I, I got your point. Uh, with regards to the hermaphrodite, uh, sometimes the person happened to carry the two genital systems of uh, male and a female genitals. And this is very, very rare. Now, the religious scholars are going to seek the assistance of the scientists and physiologists and the doctors ask because we have to figure out whether the person has tendency more towards whichever gender and based on having a complete genital system and so on so that will determine whether it is possible for innocence to eliminate one of them and to be treated like a male or a female as i said this is something very very rare so based on the advice of the scientists we can help that person to choose their fate, whether they would like to be treated as a male and a female and undergo any surgery which would help him to function properly in the light of this uh, advice. Barakallah feek. Uh, Naam. So we answered the question about pointing with the finger and that is the sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ used to do and he advised to do it uh, while praying. It's also advised in another hadith that is narrated by the great companion Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. Uh, the following question is, if I'm not satisfied with the hijab, this one sister, can I just remove it uh, if I feel like I want to remove it or I would be better off without it? Uh, I would like to begin with a hadith, very important hadith. This hadith does not only answer the sister's question, but it answers plenty of questions. It regulates the relationship between the servant and the creator. The servant and the prophets or the messengers whom Allah the Almighty, the creator, have appointed to communicate his message to them. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه very beautiful hadith. He says in this hadith, peace be upon him, that none of you would become a perfect believer, not unless if his hawa, if his desire, if his whim, would follow whatever 
I brought of guidance. We know that there is a desire, a whim, a lust, and this is very normal with every human being. And in fact, I would like to elaborate on that and say, when Allah the Almighty created Al-Jannah and An-Nar, Paradise and the Far of Hell, He sent Angel Gabriel, peace be upon him, to check them out and file a report. How do you like them? So Jibreel alayhi salam returned after paying a visit to Al-Jannah and he said, I swear to your honor and majesty, I don't think any human being would hear of Al-Jannah, but would definitely enter it. Because of the joy, the delight, and the magnificent word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for its dwellers in Al-Jannah. Then when he checked out the fire of hell and saw its severe torment, he said, I swear to your honor and majesty, no one would ever hear of its torment and would enter it. Then Allah the Almighty made some modifications to both Al-Jannah and Al-Nar. He surrounded Al-Jannah with what? With hardship and difficulties, with tests and trials, with a lot of patience that is required. Then he surrounded Al-Nar with lust, desire, and things that people covet and love. Then he ordered Jibreel alayhi salam to check it out again, both Al-Jannah and Nar. When he returned, his remark concerning Al-Jannah, which is now surrounded with hardship and difficulty. Difficulty in, oh, you have to get up every morning to pray Fajr. You have to pray five times a day. You have to fast. You have to give zakah. You have to perform hajj. You must cover up your hair. You must wear hijab. You must not have an illicit relationship. You must not drink. You must avoid all bad things. Do's and do not do's. Okay? He said, I'm afraid that nobody's going to make it because of the serious tests and trials. Do's and do not do's. Then when he checked out the far off, he surrounded with glitter, with worldly attractions, with desire, things that people love to do. He said, I'm afraid that nobody will skip it. Nobody will be saved from it. What happened is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us saying, لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان Don't you follow the footsteps of Satan. You know what happens? Satan makes it seem fair and perfectly fine for us to commit the sin. Why? Because ever since we were created, there is a challenge between us and a shaytan. A shaytan was expelled from heaven for not <coughs> complying with Allah's order, for not greeting Adam alayhi salam with bowing down to him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. So he said, I shall mislead as many of them as I can to take them to the fire with me. That's why if this drink, which is lawful, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a hot drink, it's nice, halal, water and some herbs. If this drink was specified in the Quran as haram and you should not drink it, or milk was made haram instead of wine and wine was halal, guess what? People would have desired milk and lost interest in wine. It's only a matter of tests and trial. So I will continue with answering this question, inshallah, after the short break. I would uh, request everybody to stay tuned, please. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. So the sister who said that can I just take off the hijab whenever I feel like it, uh, if I'm not satisfied. So basically I give this introduction of the do's and do not do's and uh, the means of tests and trials in order to be either eligible to enter al-jannah or otherwise may Allah forgive us all and protect us against the fire of hell. So since we already recognize our relationship with our Lord, that He's the creator and we are the creation, He's the master and we are the servants, 
it is not befitting to question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and question his wisdom and his judgment. Why? Even though he explained in many ahkam, in many do's and many do not do's, the reason and the wisdom behind it, but he doesn't owe us to explain uh, the wisdom behind every ruling. So for instance, with regards to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered women in ayah number 31 of Surah An-Nur and in ayah number 59 of Surah Al-Ahzab to cover up their aura, to cover up their hair, their heads and their chest and, and so on. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <coughs> that he ordered an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say to his wives, his daughters, and to the Muslim women of the entire ummah at large to do what? وَلِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِ بِهِنْ ذَلِكَ أَدَنَا أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَ فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنَ So here he mentioned the reason why that these women Muslim women should wear hijab in order to be recognized that she's a chaste woman. Because basically when a woman wears a full makeup and a very attractive perfume and she sat before the mirror for an hour fixing her hair, having somebody to fix her hair and so on, and she goes out wearing tight jeans or short blouses, what happens? Everybody would look at her. People would keep looking at her. And this is a mean of temptation. And one thing leads to another. So in order to guarantee and maintain chastity in the society, chastity of women, chastity of, uh, of men as well, this beauty of this woman is only for her husband. And also the husband is not allowed to look at the beauty of another woman because he already has his lawful mean to satisfy his desire in a lawful uh, mean. So sister, it is not up to us to pick and choose whenever it is obligatory, whenever it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered, whenever it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandated, whether in the Quran, in a clear ayah, or by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in a sound hadith. <coughs> uh, the following question is, who wrote the Quran? Tell you the truth, uh, I don't exactly know what do you mean by who wrote the Quran. If you mean that of the companions, like since the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Ummi, he neither read nor wrote, and that was for wisdom. And you're asking who used to write down the Wahy. Once it was revealed, uh, we have plenty of names. Zayd ibn Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him. Uh, Ubay ibn Ka'b, um, Abdullah ibn Arqam, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hudayfa ibn Al-Yaman, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, many companions, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with all the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these companions used to write down and scribe the wahi once it was revealed. Initially, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make an effort to memorize innocently every revelation that Jibreel السلام, would reveal to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he would repeat it quickly and he would make an effort to memorize it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him in Surah Al-Qiyamah, لا تحرك لسانك به لتعجل, به لسانك لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه وقرآنه. Don't you keep moving your tongue swiftly in order to memorize it. لتعجل به. It is our job and our task to compile it in your heart and make you perfect it and master its reading and so on. So these companions, once a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would receive the wahi, he would call whoever is available and order him to write down this ayah or these ayat. If you not, I avoid using the term verse, which you find as the translation, the literal translation for the word ayah, because it is not right. The word ayah is not only limited to a phrase or a verse. Ayah is a miracle, and every ayah of the ayat of the Quran 
is a miracle. And it's a sign. That's why I like to use the term ayah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named it in the Quran. So he, they would write down what the Prophet وسلم, would dictate to them. They didn't have those sheets and papers. and So what they used to do is they used to write down on the animal tan skin. When they slaughter a camel or a sheep and they tan its skin. And they would use the ink and a bamboo and write down against that animal skin. Leather. Or uh, the, the, the bark of the trees. And also on wood, on stones. And they used to write on the bones of the camels, especially the clavicle bone, because it was very broad. So when the Nabi Sallallahu passed away, and there was a need to compile all of that in one volume. Uh, we'll talk about this after this phone call, inshallah. Ninda from France, Assalamu Alaikum. Sister Ninda, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salam. Oh, brother, um, how are you? I'm fine. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. Okay, go ahead. I want to ask the, in the, if you are fasting. Hello? I, I can hear you. Go ahead and present your question okay. fully, please. If look at the house and to go through it, to see many, many things, and you are fasting, I want to ask about that. Brother Minda, what happened is your voice was breaking off. I only could hear that you said, if you're fasting and the word house. So I would yeah. appreciate if you can repeat your question. If you are fasting and you look the television in your house, the TV has many, many things in, is there. That is good or not because of if many, many people are fasting and then they are using to look the TV. Okay, uh, you're asking uh, about watching television while fasting. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 <clears throat> Now, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, said, إِذَا صُمْتَ فَلْيَصُمْ سَمْعُكْ وَلْيَصُمْ بَصَرُكْ وَلْيَصُمْ لِسَانُكَ عَنِ الْكَذِبِ which means whenever you're fasting, it isn't only about fasting, abstaining from eating, drinking, and so on. Also, your eyesight should observe fasting. You should lower your gaze. You should not look at what Allah has forbidden. So if anything on the screen, you're watching me on the screen right now. There is halal and there is haram. So if you're watching halal materials, yes, you can do that. Especially if you're watching something that is useful. But if you're watching haram, then it is not permissible to watch it like watching series and movies and women and so on, uh, whether in Ramadan or outside Ramadan. But it only gets worse if you do that while fasting and during Ramadan because it would decrease the reward for your fasting and it can affect it negatively. Barakallah <clears throat> fiku. We're talking about compiling the Quran and who wrote uh, the Quran. During the era of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the first caliph, may Allah be pleased with him, the companions, Umar ibn Khattab and many other companions, suggested to, um, to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq that what happened, what happens whenever any of those who have memorized the Quran by heart die. What happened whenever they die? Uh, we want to maintain the Quran in one volume. So they suggested so, and they made istikhara, and they consulted the companions. The Quran has been already compiled in the house of the companions, and also in writing. So they entrusted Zayd ibn Thabit, one of the scribes of the Wahi, to put all of that in one volume. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tayyib, uh, that's a question. <coughs> sister Mariam, I wanted to ask, would you advise a single sister looking for marriage who live in the West? Where can we look for a good spouse if we're shy and uh, don't live with our parents? 
uh, I, I truly thank you, Sister Mariam, for entrusting us with this question. And this is something that we have to face. Uh, during my visits to Europe, to the States, and, uh, you know, wherever we have uh, Muslims, like a minority, or it's not an Islamic society, we're confronted with the fact that, mashallah, the sisters outnumber the brothers. And many sisters have already passed the marriageable age and they're still looking and so on. So how can they go about it? I find the best way is if you live by uh, a masjid or an Islamic center, the local imam or the community leader of this masjid, he's actually your guardian. Especially as you said that you don't have parents who are living with you or you live away from your parents. So it would be perfectly okay when we trust this person to deposit our proposal with him and ask him. If you ever know a good brother who is willing to uh, settle and get married and so on, this is how we uh, take the means and it is not haram. And uh, you would not actually hurt yourself when you do that because you entrusted a person who is supposedly uh, a trustworthy person, the imam, the religious leader. And everywhere I go, I advise the Muslim community that they should have a matrimonial uh, committee. Some brothers and some sisters who uh, do the matchmaking and can be trusted with the secrets of uh, the proposals uh, whether of men uh, and or women and also do the marriage counseling even if they charge for that in order to facilitate this process trust me it would be of a great help to the entire community even if these people do it as a business with a minimal payment in order to facilitate for the single brothers and sisters to find the good suitors barakallah fikum and uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for you and for every single sister to find uh, the right life mate. Allahumma ameen. <coughs> Supposedly we have another question from brother, from sister Su'at from the USA. <coughs> uh, she has several questions. Uh, if She's asking whether the prayer is valid or not if somebody does not do the sitting for the tashahud in the same way that the Prophet ﷺ used to do. That is the first question. If you're talking about the format or the description, how to sit down to put, for instance, uh, the, uh, the left foot beneath your bottom and erect your uh, right toes and so on with the, with the left foot and uh, the two different settings, whether in the middle or by the end of uh, the tashahud, which is alif tarash, for instance. These are all descriptions of how we should offer this part of the prayer. But the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, Salli qa'iman, fa'in lam tastati' faqa'idin, fa'in lam tastati' fa'ala jamb, which means you should offer the prayer while standing. If you can't stand up, then you may sit down. Even if you can sit down, pray while reclining. In any position that you can afford, make sure that you're facing the Qibla. So sometimes a person cannot really bend the left foot beneath themselves, cannot do the iftarash, cannot do the, this format. Do whatever you can afford and the prayer is valid and you do not owe any ransom or any uh, sujood sahu for innocence by the end. The second question, <clears throat> طيب. Actually, we're going to take a short break and inshallah soon after that I will answer your second question, Sister uh, Suad from the USA. Everybody, please stay tuned. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Mariam from the UK, welcome to the program. Jazakallah khair, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Yes, uh, I have a question that I read a hadith recently uh, which says that after eating anything that has been touched by fire, 
we need to perform wudu again. So I just wanted to ask what kind of foods um, does it consist of? I mean, anything that you... No, okay. Any other questions? Oh, no, that's it. Just after love. All right. Thank you, sister. Mariam. Okay. Uh, that was effective at one point, but it has been abrogated. So you do not necessarily have to perform wudu after eating anything that has been touched by fire. Barakallah fiki. Uh, so basically, all the food that we cook or the barbecue or the grilled meat is been touched directly or indirectly by fire. We don't have to make wudu uh, after we eat it. Uh, while we had Sister Saad from the USA before uh, the last break, her second question is, <clears throat> a woman was having problems with al uh, for almost a month. And at one point she thought that she was having it and she continued praying and have even an intimate relationship with her spouse. But after two days, she realized that it was actually the period. What is the kafara for uh, that? Okay, number one. Al-istihada is the irregular bleeding. The regular is a monthly period. Every woman has this cycle which varies from a woman to another five six seven days more or less so that's why whenever a woman starts to have an irregular bleeding post the period and it's lasting for several days we say that shouldn't stop you from your regular rituals from the prayers from tawaf from reading quran not even from having an intimate relationship provided that of course you should be very careful and uh, uh, both spouses have to take a precaution against uh, that while having this intimate relationship. The point is now, for the istihada, that you're supposed to perform wudu prior to every prayer once its time has entered. With this wudu, you can pray the fard and all the relating nawafil until the next prayer time. The sister thought all what she's having was istihada. So she enjoyed praying, doing everything, including having the intimate relationship. Then later on, she found out that actually that was the next period. It was an istihada. What is the kafara? There is no kafara. Rufi'a an ummati al-khata' wa nisya'an wa mastukrihu alayh. An nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, any error, any sin, whether major or minor, which happened as a result of any of the following conditions. Al-khata' error, you made it by mistake, you didn't know. Al-nisyan, our forgetfulness. Wa mastukrihu alay, if the person has been forced under life threat to do it or not to do it, then the punishment will be waived. So you did not know and you did not do it deliberately, it will be sufficient to make istighfar. Assalamu alaikum, Ibrahim from Nigeria. Ya Ibrahim, Assalamu alaikum. Are you there? Okay. Huh? Okay. Try again, Brother Ibrahim, please. The following question is, actually, when I'm reading the Quran, there are several words and ayat that I do not understand. And I read it wrong. What can I do? Do you think that everybody can just understand every word in the Quran? Of course not. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and in the second hadith, which is narrated by Uthman ibn Affan and collected by Imam al-Bukhari, very profound hadith, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The first hadith says, uh, in order to be knowledgeable, to be a learned person, you have to seek knowledge, of course. And the second, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the best of all of you is the one who learns the Quran and teaches it to others. I remember once in, in, uh, in, in the States, in one community I was talking about, I was trying to assure the non-Arab that it isn't only you that who sometimes have uh, an issue with understanding some of the ayat and the verses of the Quran. And one of the Arab brothers said, no, uh, we understand everything in the Quran, it's our language. So we just happened to recite one of the short surahs. 
we by the way can say short so Rabbi, we cannot say small because all the Quran is great so I said okay this surah do you know what is the meaning of any of its ayat والعاديات ضبحا فالموريات قدحا فالمغيرات صبحا فأثرنا به نقعا فوسطنا به جمعا do you understand any of that he said no he said that's why إنما العلم بالتعلم we have to learn in order to understand this so you may be a PhD holder in science, in math, in physics, in whatever. But in the Quran, you didn't make any effort. You don't know how to read it. So sit with the sheikh, with a private tutor, in a halqa, in a masjid. There are many softwares now. There are many recorded programs uh, uh, for free. For instance, there is a program which I have been presenting for the past five years called Correct Your Recitation. And it's all available for free. Many, many episodes. You can learn by following this program episode by episode. It's all available for free on the YouTube and many other sites. So following these programs, sitting with a sheikh, with a qari, with a private tutor, inshallah will make you uh, a knowledgeable person in the Quran. Not only in learning how to recite it, but also in learning its meaning. After I graduated from Al-Azhar and I got several degrees and so on, I started again trying to get an ijazah different than the earlier ijazah which I got in the Quran. And subhanAllah, as I was sitting before the Sheikh, he squeezed me. In every ayah, he, he, he finds many errors. I couldn't imagine that I was making that many errors. I actually suspected that he deliberately is trying to put me down, but I realized that subhanAllah, he wants me to achieve perfection. And that's why the system of ijazah is an amazing system. Ijazah is when you recite the entire Quran properly before a sheikh who has this permit from another one and the long chain of the shuyukh is connected all the way to the Prophet وسلم, to Jibreel وسلم, to Allah the Almighty. Because if you recite it in this fashion and you get the ijazah, that means you're reciting the Qur'an the same way as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala read it. Because the Qur'an wasn't created, no. The Qur'an was stayed, was uttered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was recited by Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Qur'an saying, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا You must recite the Qur'an with a melodious voice, beautifully, with the proper ahkam. So remember, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالْتَعَلْمُ Spend some time, make some effort, even if it is little, but make sure it is constant. Because basically, whenever we're doing anything which is not relating to our worldly activities, يعني I understand that if your job, if your work, if your business require you to attend a course, or to study something in order to pass a test or get a license, you will do it. You will excuse yourself to do it. Versus when you say, yeah, inshallah, I'm planning to learn the Quran. Okay, inshallah, when one day, two years pass by, five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, and so on, and the person achieved nothing. Why? Because there is no such commitment. He may start all of a sudden <clears throat> with a very intensive uh, course or study then he slows down then he quits that's why a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith which is narrated by Aisha Umm al Mu'mineen, may Allah be pleased with her that the dearest and the most beloved deed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is adwamuhu wa inqal the one which is constant and consistent even if it is lero I would like to share with you and maybe <coughs> the person who is the hero of this story may be listening to me right now. It happened in Texas, in one of the cities there. I had a revert who entered our center once. That was a few years ago. And he saw us was sitting in Halqah reading the Quran. He was very impressed with the way that everybody, most of them are non-Arab. The mother tongue is English, is whatever, and they're reading Quran properly. We have some Arab as well. 
Then I saw tears in his eyes. I said, what's going on? He said, I wish I can read the Quran like you guys. I wish I can enjoy understanding and reading the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, unfortunately, I can't. I say, why can't you? I said, I just can't. I said, if you give me 15 minutes every day, inshallah, we will do it. And since he was in the medical field and every morning he has to go to his clinic, he dedicated the 15 minutes early morning before going to work, before going to the clinic at Fajr, and sometimes, wallahi, before we pray Fajr. 15 minutes every day. Six months. Only six months. And when he was sitting with us in the halqa, he was reciting as good as anyone of us who was born and raised in a Muslim country, reciting the Quran beautifully with the proper ahkam from the scratch, brothers and sisters. From the scratch. On the other hand, we have seen many Arab whom we meet in Hajj, we meet in conferences or whatever. They are reluctant to sit in a halqa to read the Quran. Do you know why? Once we invite them, they say, I'm busy, I'm actually doing something else. I know that he is hesitant to attend because he is afraid to be exposed. He doesn't know how to read a single ayah of the Quran. Why? He hasn't tried. His parents didn't teach him. They cared about other stuff. He didn't have the opportunity for a reason or another. So I would like to assure you, it is never too late. One of my students who was a priest in America and he accepted Islam and he started learning at the age of 70 or 72. He was over 70 and after he accepted Islam, he started learning the Quran and how to read the Quran and so on. So if there is a will, there is a way. Also keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِن مُدَّكِرٍ Allah said it. Indeed, we have made the Qur'an easy to be recited, to be remembered, to be memorized, to be understood. Assalamu alaikum, Walid from Holland. Wa alaikum assalam. Kayf al-hamd, Ramadan al-Kareem. Barakallahu feek. Thank you so much. How are you? Barakallahu feek. Alhamdulillah, I am fine. Uh, Sheikh, I want to ask, uh, how is the, in Facebook for, for ladies use, for example, sometimes it's too much fitna, sometimes it's, it's good, but how is the deen from Facebook uh, and uh, some contact internet for ladies? Make sure you don't put your photo for a lady, for instance, your personal okay. or your family photos, okay, you can put whatever picture, because this is indeed a source of fitna, and actually it is inviting others to communicate with you without a need. No, I mean, example, Rijal is another thing, but ladies, it's is, is very easy to, the fitna of, of, of picture, some of uh, to Facebook, to contact with uh, boys, but how is the Dean, I ask? How? Dean, what is that, that, that in the, that, uh, yani, that is, that the is, is that possible or of not possible? Okay, well, whether lawful or not, okay. Uh, the, the, the social networks, whether Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and the phones, the cell phones, and the emails, and the web pages, or whatever, these are all means of communication. It facilitates a lot of things. It makes easy a lot of things. It shares a lot of knowledge, but sometimes it is misused broadly. Sometimes it is broadly misused. Whenever you use it within the lawful, it is halal. Whenever you, lo whenever you misuse it, then it becomes haram. Chatting with a girl, starting a friendship in Islam. There is no such thing. You like a girl, get married. But to chat with a girl and take a girlfriend and another girlfriend here and there and start sharing love words and statements just because you're friends online, that is not permissible. And subhanAllah, many marriage life were ruined because of that. Either the wife is chatting with somebody else or the husband. And very interesting story I heard that, that once a couple who were married, she started a relationship chatting with a person online and he did. And every person was giving the other person an impression that she was a beauty queen and she was a most decent person and he likewise was describing himself 
Then finally, they decided to meet. When they met, they only found that they were the same couple who were married. Brother Walid from Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. How are you and welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheikh. Jazakum uh, Allah khair. I have a question here about uh, we are living in a small uh, city, uh, northern Canada, and uh, there is no mosque available uh, for a Muslim community here. Uh, my question, uh, is it uh, okay to get a fund uh, and uh, donations from a non-Muslim government to support and build a mosque? Okay. And, uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brother Walid. Uh, number one, Wallahi, I feel very sorry for you living somewhere where you don't have a masjid. This is not life. To me, this is equivalent to death. When one Jum'ah passes by, and two Jum'ahs, and three Jum'ahs, and you don't pray Jum'ah, and you don't pray Jama'at, and you don't listen to the dhikr, you don't enjoy meeting the brothers and sisters in the masjid, this is closer to death than it to life. So as far as answering the question, can we accept fund from the government, our non-Muslims, to build a masjid? Yes, no problem. You can do that if you cannot afford to do it uh, yourself. <coughs> طيب we'll take a short break and inshallah we'll be back with the last segment in a couple of minutes stay tuned Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back sister uh, Amina from France. Her question is actually in the form of a complaint. She just uh, scarred us with the question right now. She says my question is uh, in Islam the family relations are fundamental but my stepsister is lying about me because uh, I'm living alone with my kids. They don't let me meet my mother. My mother calls me hiddenly and they do injustice, etc., etc. Subhanallah, it is exactly as you just mentioned in the beginning. Maintaining family ties and upholding the ties of kinship in Islam is something that is very fundamental. In many occasions, you find in the Quran, and in the sound sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ puts a lot of emphasis on the importance of upholding the ties of kinship. So every person is required to take care of his family, family members, the closest, then the closer, and so on. Particularly the parents. You're talking here about your mother. Subhanallah, you find in, in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, or in Surah uh, Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala second the command of Tawheed. Number two, the command of upholding the ties of kinship, particularly the parents. He says in Surah Al-Nisa, وَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا دِنْ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Worship Allah alone and do not set partners to him in worship and be good to your parents. Serve them, honor them, love them and respect them. In Surah Al-Isra, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا Then second that by, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And treat them well, treat your parents very well, do good to your parents. Any person who comes in between, in order to sever the relationship, is a big time sinner. Once a Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم was asked, because a Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم awfully spoke about it, the companions uh, were very concerned. Somebody came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have some relatives whom I uphold their ties, I check on them, I ask about them, I visit them, but they always sever my rela their relations to me. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Well, if this is the case, then فَكَأَنَّمَا تُصِفُّهُمُ Mal Al-mal is the dirt, the hot sand. If this is the case, then it will be like you're feeding them uh, hot sand. Yani, you will be a winner, you will be rewarded, y your work will be appreciated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they will be in a terrible shape. They will be severely punished. 
by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if any person is trying to ruin the relationship between a, a son and one of the parents or the parents or a daughter and the parents uh, actually will be uh, subjected to the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is doing entirely the opposite of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide your sister or your stepsister and uh, uh, I would advise you to continue upholding the ties of your kinship no matter what they do to you. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, لَيْسَ الْوَاصِلُ مَنْ يَصِلُ مَنْ وَصَلَهُ وَلَكِنَّ الْوَاصِلَ مَنْ يَصِلُ مَنْ قَطَعَهُ الْوَاصِل is a person who connects. The person who connects his ties, upholds his ties to his kinship, maintains checking on them, visiting them, taking care of them. He said, this description, al-wasil, isn't for the person who exchange visits. Or because they check on me, I check on them. Because they give me a gift, I give them a gift. No, he said, no. Al-wasil, the true wasil, the true connector, is the person who connects those who sever their relations to him. I know it's challenging, but it is worth it. Their word is magnificent. You see their word and the compensation in this life before death. You know that one of the great means of increasing one's provision is what? Upholding the ties of kinship. Now, uh, the following question is, can you give me a dua for my depression? And a dua that will give me strength and power and energy. Uh, something uh, sometimes that will take negative things out of my head. Okay, let's answer one thing at a time. The first part, a dua to relieve you from the depression, give you strength, power, and energy. You got it. Very beautiful dua. I'm going to say it in Arabic, then I will provide you its meaning, insha'Allah Azza Jal. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it does it all. It answers all what you just asked about right now. It's to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan, wal-ajizi wal-kasal, wal-jubani wal-bukhl, wa-ghalabati al-dayni wa-qahri al-rijal. In another narration, what does it mean? You are seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against all of what you complained about. Weakness, depression, worry, um, being in debt, laziness, cowardliness. So Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you against al hamm wal-hazan. Alham is the worry and al-hazan is the sadness. Alham is what to worry about in the future. And al-hazan pertaining the past. And this is what caused depression. So I seek refuge with you and I seek shelter in you against everything that may cause me to be worried or sad or sorrow in the past, present or in the future. والعجز والكسل and I seek refuge in you against disability and laziness والجبن والبخل and I seek refuge with you against cowardliness weakness and stinginess and miserliness <coughs> وأعوذ بك من غلبة الدين وقهر الرجال and I seek refuge with you against being overcome by debt or overpowered by men. If you say this dua every morning and in every evening, then insha'Allah you will achieve what you're looking for and you will not have the sort of depression. She says also, sometimes I think about negative things out of my head. I get scared when people pass away too and this really puts me down. I hope we are not talking here about a psychiatric condition because if this is the case, the panic attacks or whatever, then right away I would refer you to a psychiatric. Because we also, in Islam, 
believe in and respect professionalism. Sometimes uh, people think that everything is because of the jinn. And uh, whenever you advise somebody to visit a psychiatrist, they look at it, look, I'm not crazy. I'm not insane. It's not about being insane. Sometimes there is uh, some syndromes that need to be treated, some deficiency in, uh, uh, in, in, in the functions of any part of the brain that need to be treated. Why not? No problem. But if it is only because of the worries and the sadness or so, the dua would do it, whether it is psychological, psychiatric, or just mere depression. But if it is something psychiatric, you also need to seek the proper medication in order to help you out to overcome this. As far as the thoughts which scares you, or the thoughts which you don't want to think about because you, you say that it's awful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fussilat, وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Which means, and whenever any evil thought or whisper comes to you from Satan, then you should seek refuge in Allah. He is indeed the all-hearer, the all-knowing. Allah will suffice you. Allah will protect you. Allah will be your shelter. Every time a bad thought would cross your mind, then say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. As a matter of fact, the companions, once some of them came to the Prophet وسلم, and they complained that sometimes they have very bad thoughts. They are afraid if they talk about it, they will be like, you know, disbelievers and so on. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Satan would come to one of you and say, who created the heavens? And right away will give you the answer, it must be Allah. And who created the earth? Allah. And who created you? It must be Allah. And he will keep taking you from one thing to another until he will whisper to you to think about this. And who created Allah? So the Prophet said, if you ever find this, then you should seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a shaitan would deliberately do this to the person because he sees him in a state of belief or faith. So he wants to ruin up his iman. We can think about Allah's creatures and think about his power, magnificent power in creating, in giving life after death, etc. But since we're very weak human beings with limited understanding, there is no way that we can comprehend Allah's being. So we can only think about His creation, His power, and the signs of His magnificent power, not about His being, other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us uh, about Himself. <coughs> now, uh, again, second question with regards to the same subject in, uh, in the same episode. Why is it obligatory for women to cover up their hair? Because it is obligatory. How is that? Remember, you just mentioned the beginning, obligatory. Yes, indeed, it is obligatory. What makes any hukm, any order, or any do obligatory? And what makes it forbidden? What makes it obligatory is that it is mentioned in the Quran. Like a salah. Aqimu salata wa atu zakah. Offer the prayer and pay zakah. Perform hajj. Fast during Ramadan. These are all commands. Obligatory. And also, the ayat which I mentioned two segments back was an indication that it is obligatory for women to cover up their hair and wear hijab. It is not optional. I know that because of long traveling here and there, once after one khutbah, one sister, and I was in America, asked me and she said, I never knew that hijab is a must for all women. I think, I used to think it's an Arabic tradition that women in, in the peninsula wear the hijab because it's very hot there and because of the sandstorm and so on. I said, no, it's in the Quran. Wallahi, this sister, ever since she heard so, she wore the hijab because she did not know. So it is obligatory because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it 
obligatory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nur, إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ruled any verdict or passed any command, the believers respond to it by saying, yes, definitely we heard and we obeyed. Spontaneous response and compliance with the teachings and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum subhanakallah wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk brothers and sisters until next episode I leave you in the care of Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bye, Tawa.